Jesus' crucifixion ends with a stab of a simple wooden spear. For 2,000 years, some of the most powerful men in history covet its power. Could one of these three relics have pierced the side of Christ? At last, modern science provides answers to the legend of the Holy Spear. The legend of the Holy Spear begins at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us his death is mercifully quick. A Roman guard pierces Jesus' side with a spear to confirm that he is dead. It's a crucial moment in the Christian faith. Proof of Christ's death and what makes his resurrection possible. In the centuries that follow, the spear becomes a preeminent Christian relic and assumes a legendary reputation. Emperor Constantine is said to hold the Holy Spear when he imposes Christianity on the Roman Empire. With the spear by his side, Charlemagne forges the first European Union out of the chaos of the Middle Ages. And both Napoleon and Hitler seek the spear's mythical power so they might rule the world. Today, there are three holy spears that are not known copies or fakes. One in Armenia, one in the Vatican, and the Vienna spear. Could one of these be the spear of Christ, the relic of legendary power? Peter Owen Jones is a priest in the Church of England. He's embarking on a quest to examine the history of each spear and determine if it could have been present at the moment of Jesus' crucifixion. The spear, like many other Christian icons, is an incredibly important part, not just of Christian history, but of all history. Robert Feather, a specialist in ancient metals and artifacts, will assess each spear to determine its age and origin. The three spears, from a scientific and historical viewpoint, all have a strong indication that they date from a very early time in history, possibly close to the time of Jesus. After the crucifixion, the first report of the Holy Spear comes from Armenia, where locals claim to still possess it. Here Peter begins his search. This is Etchmiadzin Cathedral. It's the heart and soul of the Armenian Apostolic Church, and this is where they keep their Holy Spear. How it gets here is an amazing story. According to the Armenian Church, one of Jesus' 12 disciples brings the Holy Spear to Armenia. The Apostle Thaddeus arrives here just a couple of years after the crucifixion. He carries the Holy Spear and the pagan priests feel very threatened by his presence, so they have him beheaded. But before he's killed, Thaddeus converts a few pagans to Christianity. They protect the Holy Spear, possibly hiding it in a secret cave, which later becomes a monastery named Gehard, meaning spear in Armenian. It remains hidden for over 200 years, until a local man named Gregory challenges the pagan priests by preaching the gospel in Armenia. But the pagans are powerful, and Gregory is soon imprisoned. 
In the shadow of Mount Ararat, where Noah's Ark is said to have landed, sits the ancient Armenian monastery of Hor Verat. Here Peter uncovers the next chapter in Gregory's story. Gregory is tortured and thrown into a pit full of snakes, which was located here. And he's kept there for 13 long years. Miraculously, Gregory survives 13 years in a pit full of snakes. Legend says that he then recovers the Holy Spear. And with the Holy Spear in his hand, he defeats the pagan gods. He converts the king and all his court to Christianity. And in the year 301 AD, Armenia becomes the first Christian state. Relics have the power to draw people together under one belief system, the flag of faith, if you like. If you believe you are blessed, if you believe you have the all-powerful spear in your possession, then you're actually going to behave in quite a different way. The spear is placed in the heart of the Armenian Mother Church, the Etchmiadzin Cathedral. It is uh, uh, one of the most sacred things we have as a, as a church. The Armenian church only takes its holy spear out once every seven years, but Peter is granted special permission to see it. Did this spear pierce the side of Christ 2,000 years ago? Robert Feather has had a replica made of the Armenian spear. He shows it to Mark Hassel, an expert on Roman weapons. It's not the spear that went in the side of Jesus. It's not. Why not? Because it's not a, it's not a Roman spear. The head is totally, totally right. different. Absolutely. Completely different. Totally different. The Armenian church accepts that its spear is not a Roman weapon, but they say it's one used by Jewish soldiers of the time. Feather and Hassel conclude that the Armenian spear was likely not at Jesus' crucifixion. Nevertheless, legend says the power of its legacy helped convert a whole nation to Christianity. Another spear is also famous for its role in a religious power struggle between the two dominant religions of its day. Peter's investigation of the next spear, the Vatican Spear, begins here, by the ancient walls of Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul. 600 years after the crucifixion, Jerusalem is conquered by the Persians. Here, the tale of the Vatican Spear literally splits in two. Somehow around this time, the tip of the spear gets broken off. We don't know how but it ends up here in Constantinople, the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, where it is set into a jewel-encrusted crucifix. It ended up here in what was then the Christian church of San Sophia, but it would be another 80 years before the other part of the spear joined it. One can only imagine the negotiations, the horse trading that must have taken place to prize such a valuable relic out of Jerusalem. Both parts of the spear remain in Constantinople for the next 600 years. Until a French king, Louis IX, buys the spear tip. He believes that the important relic gives him a direct link to God and therefore immense honor and prestige. The tip in its bejeweled cross is kept in Paris until it disappears during the French Revolution. The 
rest of the spear blade remains in Constantinople until the city falls to the Muslims in the 15th century. The Western world is divided into these two enormous blocks, Christianity and Islam. The Spear of Christ is also in two pieces. The tip is in Paris and the main bulk of it is in Islamic Constantinople. In 1492, the Sultan gives the rest of the spear blade to the Pope in exchange for him keeping his brother, who is claiming the Sultan's throne, locked up in Italy. It's an incredible pact between the leaders of two great warring religions. The spear, minus his tip, is put into St. Peter's Basilica and seldom seen again. Today, the Vatican makes no claims to its authenticity. If this is the true spear, the authentic one, then it provides an understanding of the redeeming passion of Christ and the mercy of God who doesn't seek revenge for the wrong he was done. The Vatican will not show their spear, nor allow it to be scientifically tested. So Robert Feather tracks down the only existing images of the Vatican spear, a set of drawings made in the early 1900s. He shows them to Mark Hassel. And it doesn't come out very well. So, I mean, this could, this could be a genuine Roman spear. If you can imagine there being this sort of collar at that stage, or rather here. Even though the Vatican and the Armenian church greatly value their spears, Feather can't find any solid proof to link them to the crucifixion. So he and Peter turn their attention to the third and final spear, the famous Vienna spear. And their investigation soon reveals an astounding secret. Inside Vienna's Kunsthistorisches Museum is a Schatzkammer treasure house, home to the Vienna spear and a collection of some of Europe's most fabulous jewels and relics. This is Peter's next port of call on the strange journey of this extraordinary relic. The history of the Vienna Spear is a story of power, glory and greed. Its reputation is astonishing. Even if the legends surrounding it are partly true, it has helped shape the fate of mankind. Unlike the other spears, this one doesn't belong to a church. The museum grants Robert Feather permission to test the spear. For an expert on ancient metals, this is as good as it gets. What he discovers sends Peter off on an astonishing journey through the ages, tracking the story of the spear as it crosses paths with some of the most powerful and terrifying characters of the last 2,000 years. Feather's investigation is a unique opportunity to test physical aspects of the priceless relic. I was offered special access to do non-destructive testing on the Vienna Spear. And what I found was quite extraordinary. As we waited for the spear to be brought from the Schatzkammer Museum, I became more and more excited. Here was an opportunity to examine a relic of enormous historical significance. The spear was taken apart for cleaning in 1970, and the museum took a series of photographs. They show that the spear is made up of many different parts. The photos also reveal that beneath the outer golden sheath is a hidden silver one, with the inscription, Lancia Sancti Morici Sanctus Mauritius. The Holy Lance of St. Maurice. Who is the Saint Maurice? In a lakeside village, Peter unearths the answer. According to legend, in the years following the crucifixion, the Holy Spear is passed down among early Christians 
until it reaches Egypt. There, it finds its way into the hands of a Roman centurion named Mauritius, or Maurice. Maurice is Christian and commands a legion of Christian soldiers. It's the year 286, and Maurice is on the move. Roman Emperor Maximian orders Maurice and his legion to help him put down a violent uprising in Gaul, near Lake Geneva in present-day Switzerland. But by the time he gets there, the rebellion has already been violently crushed. Morris is horrified to discover that the slaughtered men are fellow Christians. Now, Emperor Maximian orders pagan sacrifices for the success of the mission. And it's at that point that Morris and his men respectfully refuse to take part. All the inhabitants of the empire are supposed to sacrifice for the success of the emperor and the empire. And that the fact that the Christians don't conform is treated as a crime. Infuriated, Emperor Maximian orders the execution of the entire legion. Over 6,000 men are slaughtered. Morris's unswerving devotion to his faith in the face of certain death becomes the code of chivalry for medieval knights. Saint Morris is the patron saint of knights, soldiers and armies. Whoever inscribed the silver sleeve obviously believed that St. Maurice once carried the spear. But exactly who carved the silver sleeve and when remains a mystery. From the photos, Feather discovers that at some point the spear head was broken in two. The silver sheath was added to strengthen the spear after it was broken. The spear was likely broken when a large hole was made in the blade in order to mount a kind of nail within it. Feather takes x-rays of the blade to get a better view of the mysterious nail. The nail has an unusual shape. and may have been placed by a man who shaped the destiny of the world. Reverend Peter Owen Jones is following the legend of the Vienna Spear, and it's about to play a key role at a pivotal turning point in history. After the execution of St. Maurice and his legion, the spear finds its way into the hands of the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great. When Constantine appears, the Roman Empire is fatally divided, politically and religiously. The Western Empire is run from Italy, the Eastern Empire from Turkey. Constantine is powerful, but critically, he's ambitious. He wants to make the Roman Empire strong again. To do that, he'll need to unite it under one leader, himself. Legend has it that just before the decisive battle that gives Constantine control over the empire, he sees a vision. A flaming cross appears above the sun, and the letters in this sign, you shall conquer. Constantine is so moved by what he's seen, 
that he has the first letters of Christ's name painted on his shield and those of his soldiers. Legend also says that he carries the Holy Spear with him into battle. Constantine wins the battle and embraces Christianity. He did not believe that as a Christian emperor he could execute anyone. Therefore, he delayed his baptism because of the ancient belief that baptism wiped away previous sins, but not subsequent ones. Constantine sees in his new religion a way to unite his divided empire. So he takes a decision that changes the fate of mankind. Christianity becomes the religion of the Roman Empire. Legend says he's got the Holy Spear when he makes this decision. I mean, it's almost too good to be true. But then again, if he's carrying the spear that won him the battle, might he not also clasp it when it comes to this momentous decision? Once Constantine is emperor, he builds a new capital for his Christian empire, Constantinople. His mother, Helena, who had converted to Christianity long before Constantine, travels to the Holy Land in search of Christian relics. She returns with a rich array, including what she believes are remnants of the Holy Cross and actual crucifixion nails. She sets the nails in her son's armor to protect him. Did she also set a nail in the Holy Spear? Robert Feather continues his investigation by taking microscopic photographs of the spear. Under magnification, the nail appears even more intriguing. Now we can see that it's not actually a nail, it's a pin. And it has three bulbous lumps on it, marked with yellow crosses. What do they mean? Why are they there? Who placed them there? Feather is not allowed to carbon date the spear for fear of damage to the precious relic. But he uses x-rays, together with the old photographs, to create a virtual model of the spear to see how its many parts fit together. At the base of the spear are two blade-like wings which don't look Roman and appear to have been added later. Feather shows the x-rays to weapons expert Mark Hassel. You can see from this x-ray that the, the bottom base part is quite separate from the central shape. Right. So if you remove the, that part, are we back to a basic... That, if that's the original artifact, then that looks like a Roman spear. Why? But having this cross piece is the sort of thing that you wouldn't expect on a Roman spear, but you might get in post-Roman spears in the Dark Ages. The wing blades are probably from a dagger added in the 7th or 8th century AD. If some parts of the spear are from the Middle Ages, then perhaps the whole spear was made then. But Hassel still believes the spear head may be Roman, perhaps even from the time of Christ, and may provide a direct link to the crucifixion. Reverend Peter Owen Jones picks the story of the Vienna Spear back up at the dawn of the Middle Ages. Four hundred and seventy-six A.D. The Roman Empire in Europe collapses, overthrown by Germanic tribesmen. The order of the empire is replaced with chaos and violence. 
Many of the Vienna Spears parts are believed to have been added during this time of fear and uncertainty. Nothing is heard of the Holy Spear for 200 years, till it surfaces in the hands of a powerful Germanic warrior king. The famous Charles the Great, otherwise known as Charlemagne. Charlemagne is the devout Christian who aspires to the power and glory of ancient Rome. Legend has it that he carries the Holy Spear with him as he manages to unite nearly 12 modern-day European countries, which at that time were almost in a constant state of war. In the year 800, the Pope crowns him emperor of this vast territory. which becomes the Holy Roman Empire. Charlemagne is the most powerful man in Europe. Powerful enough to perhaps order these strange wings added to a priceless holy relic. Peter follows the spear's trail to the heart of the Holy Roman Empire, Nuremberg. This is the Nuremberg Castle. Up until the 1500s, it was home to the Holy Roman Emperors. According to the written account of the spear of the time of Charlemagne, it's very possible that the spear was in the possession of Constantine. A bishop called Lutprand of Cremona, writing in the 10th century, said that Charlemagne's spear was once owned by Constantine. Charlemagne was very interested in having a connection with Constantine as the first Christian emperor. But if Charlemagne does own the real spear, why would he add anything to it? Perhaps he doesn't have the spear at all. Perhaps he just has a copy made that looks Roman and adds the trimmings, a few trimmings of his own. Possessing a powerful relic like the Holy Spear gives Charlemagne the legitimacy to unite the warring states of his empire. The lance functions both as a marker of God or Christ's support of this ruler, that this relic which touched the body of Christ should be in his possession, and also as an example of the divine right to rule and the divine right to conquer. Perhaps that's why the inscription is added to the silver sleeve. It strengthens the claim that this is the true Holy Spear. Feather re-examines the silver sleeve to find out who put it there. Clavus Dominicus Henricus de Gracia Tertius, Romano Imperato Augustus, Henry by God's grace, the third Roman emperor, ordered this silver band to be made in order to strengthen the nail of the Lord and the lance of St. Maurice. Henry III is a descendant of Charlemagne. He is crowned Holy Roman Emperor in 1046, helping Feather to date the sleeve. The silver sheath dates from the 11th century AD. There is a golden sleeve placed over the silver one. It also carries a Latin inscription. Lancia e clavis domini, spear and nail of the Lord. Perhaps a later addition by yet another owner of the spear. In the Nuremberg Castle, Peter discovers that the next verifiable owner of the Holy Spear was a powerful ruler of the 14th century. In the mid-1300s, Charles IV is the king of Germany. He wants to become the next Holy Roman Emperor. But he will need some major relics to give him power and credibility. He gets hold of the Holy Spear. To house his relics, Charles builds an impenetrable fortress outside Prague in the heart of the Czech Republic, Castle Karlstein. Within its walls, he builds a beautiful chapel adorned with precious gems and priceless works of art. The Spear of Christ and other relics are kept in a secret chamber behind the altar. 
He believes it gives him a direct link to all the saints in heaven who come judgment day will return to earth and reclaim their relics and also look favorably on those who have looked after them well. It's believed that Charles is the one who covers over Henry's silver sleeve with a gold one of his own, probably to better impress the saints. The gold sleeve clearly dates to the 14th century AD. Both sleeves on the famous Vienna spear share the same phrase, the nail of the Lord. Can science prove these words true? Reverend Peter Owen Jones has followed the tale of the Vienna spear down through the centuries as it passes from one powerful ruler to the next. Now comes its terrible fall from grace. The early 1400s, a descendant of Charles IV needing money sells the Holy Spear to the Nuremberg Town Council. In their hands, the powerful relic becomes a main attraction in one of the most lucrative trades of the Middle Ages, the relic business. One of the primary uses of relics in the 15th century is to attract offerings, money offerings. The spear is brought out only once a year for the Feast of the Holy Lance. Pilgrims from all over Europe come to venerate it. Throughout the Middle Ages, relics are incredibly popular. They're popular because they give direct access to all the faithful to uh, heaven. One doesn't need to be literate, you don't have to learn sacred books, you just engage with a relic. In the city centre, a specially constructed temporary chapel is prepared. The noblemen and the clergy solemnly gather to take their part in the display of relics. There is a tooth belonging to John the Baptist, then a sliver of wood from the manger, an arm bone of St. Anne, and finally, the Holy Spear itself. The church is making vast profits at the expense of the faithful. Understandably, people are getting tired of being exploited. And as the movement for reformation gathers pace, the fortunes of Nuremberg begin to decline. The spear is locked away in an ornate silver casket and virtually forgotten for the next 400 years. Back in the lab, Robert Feather continues searching for any clue that might shed light on the mysterious pin mounted in the blade. He turns to an X-ray fluorescence gun to analyze the spear's metal composition. The X-ray can't date the iron in the spearhead precisely. So Hassel is called in to give his expert opinion. He believes the spearhead is probably Roman from between the first and fourth century. But the X-ray gun does come back with an intriguing reading from the pin. Peter now follows the Holy Spear into the turbulence of the late 18th century, when another conqueror craves its power and glory. It's 1796 and Napoleon is rampaging through Europe. He's also closing in on Nuremberg. And the city councillors there are terrified that if he seizes the Holy Spear, he'll become invincible. The spear held this dark promise that he who has it in his possession will rule the world. And if you believe that, and more importantly, if you can get other people to believe that, then that gives you a terrifying amount of power. The Nuremberg councillors decide to hide the spear in Vienna. The Viennese promise to return it as soon as peace is restored. Ten years later, Napoleon has conquered most of Europe, including Germany. And in doing so, he brings to an end the 1,000-year rule of the Holy Roman Empire. And during the chaos and confusion that follows, the spear remains in Vienna. 
Feather is examining the pin's round discs or roundels when he notices something strange. When you look at a higher magnification of these rondelles that appear to be quite separate from the pin itself, under the microscope you can see that the two metals are separate. And you can see the differentiation, the line separating the two types of material. The round bits must have been hammered on at some time onto the pin. The X-ray fluorescence results confirm it. The iron compositions are different, and the roundel contains significant amounts of cobalt, while the pin has none. The pin is really rather intriguing. It probably was attached at the time of Henry III in the 11th century, but we can't be sure. It's quite apparent from the XRF analysis and the X-ray pictures that we took, that the lumps, the rondelles, are quite separate from the pin. They've been added at some stage. When is not easy to say. Feather now conducts the ultimate test. He measures the metal composition of a first century Roman nail for comparison. If the results match, it could mean that the Vienna Spear includes fragments of crucifixion nails, perhaps the ones that Helena brought back from the Holy Land for the Emperor Constantine. While Feather's experiment brings him closer and closer to the crucifixion, Peter arrives at the most recent and darkest hour in the Holy Spear's history. For over 100 years, the spear remains in Vienna. Then, in 1933, Adolf Hitler seizes power. Five years later, he annexes Austria. The first move towards realizing his vision of a Nazi empire. The Third Reich. A reinvention of the Germanic Holy Roman Empire created by Charlemagne. Hitler wastes no time in appropriating the jewels and relics of the empire's glorious past. The Spear of Christ now passes into the hands of one of history's most infamous dictators. If you have a weapon as an icon, it's not surprising that warriors, those who want to conquer and control, are going to want to possess it because they're going to believe that once it's in their possession, they will be better able to practice those very dark arts. Ironically, Nuremberg is the spiritual home of the Nazis. This is where Hitler delivered his rousing speeches. Wir stehen fest zusammen. And this is where he brings the spear. In a strange twist of fate, Hitler returns the Holy Spear to Nuremberg, its home for nearly 400 years. But Hitler's dream of a Nazi empire is short-lived. By the end of April 1945, the Russian army takes Berlin. With Germany defeated, the Americans set about trying to recover all the valuable artworks and relics plundered by the Nazis from across Europe. They find the Holy Spear in here, in this bunker underneath Nuremberg Castle, along with countless other pieces of art. They return it to the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna, where it remains to this day. The results of Feather's X-ray fluorescence test on the Roman nail are in. The nail contains cobalt, just like the roundels. Could this mean that the roundels, which appear to be hammered onto the pin, come from a first century Roman nail? If that's the case, then uh, one has to reconsider the whole possibility that while the rest of the spear might well be 7th, 8th century AD, 
We have a fragment in it that was placed there because it was a much earlier piece and perhaps a part of a crucifixion nail. After taking a closer look, Feather discovers something even more startling. Something that may provide a definitive link to the crucifixion. Having completed a detailed examination of the pin mounted in the Vienna Spear, Robert Feather is finally ready to reveal what he's found. Evidence that may bring the spear closer to the crucifixion. Quite extraordinary. There's something here which is just truly amazing. You can see an image on the rondelle of the outline shape of the fish. Now, it's clearly defined. It's not a scratch mark. The fish was the secret symbol. It was the secret symbol used by Christians before the Roman Empire adopted Christianity as its religion. And they used the symbol because at times, before Constantine, they were in fear of their lives. There was the real danger that they would be tortured and executed. Feather also finds two curious letters next to the fish. Inscribed behind the fish are the two Roman letters, the I and the R, in double outlined letters, which is again reflects the kind of writing that you'd see at a very early period in history of Roman writing. What they mean is a question of speculation, but I believe they stand for Iesus Rex, Jesus the King. Over the cross, the letters Inri were inscribed, Iesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And IR was sometimes used as a, a shortened version of that. The tiny fish and letters can only be seen through a microscope. Inscribing them would have been a great technical feat during the early years of Christianity. The Petrie Museum in London houses an important collection of ancient Egyptian artifacts. Among them is a surprising miniature painting. It's of the goddess Nebke, who was, became the protector of the pharaoh. I mean, even with a magnifying glass, it's, it's not easy to see. This is a Roman period lens. It's gone opaque, but it would have been clear. But it's clearly been ground and used as a magnifying glass. And it's well over 2,000 years old, so the technology was there to see and engrave at this microscopic level. This supports the theory that the mysterious roundels could come from early Christian times. Someone has gone to the trouble of inlaying these crosses on each of them, clearly to mark them with some significant value. Whether it was a fragment of a nail used in the crucifixion of Jesus is a remote possibility, but one you cannot rule out. With Feather's investigation concluded, this discovery may tie the Vienna Spear closer to the crucifixion than ever before, an achievement of great significance to Christians of yesterday and today. The true worth of this object for us is that it is a touchstone of faith. It allows us into the mentality of what belief was it enables us to see just how powerful that belief system was. The Holy Spears are each part history and part legend. But to Christians everywhere, they're a powerful cornerstone of the faith. And their true value cannot be measured.